Um, okay, Blair, let's get started. Thank you everyone for uh, joining us. My name is James Andrews. I'm in the uh, communications team here at IDS. Uh, before I introduce the seminar and uh, introduce Terry, I just wanted to a few, uh, go over a few housekeeping rules. So I'm sure you know this already, we hold on online seminars, but please do keep yourself on mute at uh, all times. If you want to turn on your camera though, it's absolutely fine. A bit more interaction makes it a bit more hospitable. Uh, during the Q&A, you're welcome to uh, unmute yourself and ask your question, uh, or if you prefer, you can put it into the chat and I will uh, read it out for you. So let me introduce uh, our speaker, Terry Cannon. He is a research fellow here at IDS, and he teaches on the MSc Climate Change Development and Policy course. Uh, the title of today's seminar is uh, what, is, uh, what is Neoliberalism and how does it affect international, uh, how does it affect development studies? So this has become a bit of a tradition here at IDS. We uh, tend to do it every year, uh, this seminar with Terry. It's extremely popular. You can look at the uh, old videos up on YouTube and every year we slightly change it, uh, tailoring it this, uh, this time towards development studies. So although neoliberalism has uh, dominated the globe and many traditional economies uh, for nearly 40 years, it is poorly understood and uh, confusing to many. This is especially the case with how it relates to development studies and in particular aid. Uh, in this seminar, uh, Terry will be looking at the origins of the term uh, and why it's so confusing and uh, often lacks explanation. Uh, the focus uh, will be on ideas such as free trade and how they have damaged people's well-being by uh, reducing the power of governments and enabling the global role for many national economies to be captured and manipulated by large corporations and the one percent. Uh, this gives rise to a situation where development is subordinated to the power of just a few uh, and a new source of profit and domination over the poor. So Terry, if you'd like to perhaps share your screen, and we can get underway, over to you. Sure, I'll do that. Thank you very much, James. Hi, everyone. Very pleased to meet you this way. I hope eventually we will have these seminars actually at, at IDS, but we're not able to yet. Um, as well as those house rules, um, we will have plenty of time for discussion and questions at the end. But if anyone has comments or questions um, afterwards, then do please send them to me by my email, which is on the first slide. And the other thing is, if something is not very clear, please interrupt, um, either put up your hand or turn on your microphone and ask at the time, because it might be quite difficult to go back to it. Obviously, if there are um, issues for uh, discussion, then that should come at the end. But if, if I say something that you don't really follow very clearly, then just interrupt me and I'll try and clarify uh, at the time, okay? So I'm going to share my screen now, and we're being recorded. <clears throat> and uh, thumbs up from Ian, if you can see it. Yeah, thank you. Um, right. So I can't see everyone on the screen, so James can help if somebody uh, wants to ask a, a question of clarification. Um, so he'll let me know. Um, so a very big topic, and there are a lot of slides, and I'm not going to talk about all the slides. You will be able to get the slides. They will be provided um, probably in the chat box near the end. Um, and they're there for your reference. I, I will talk briefly about some of them, but there, there's a lot of text. And they're just there for your reference, and you can email questions afterwards if you want. So what I, the, where I want to start, actually, is this is not um, a highly theoretical academic issue. This is really practical, and it's affecting our everyday lives. Because a lot of the discussions around Brexit, around Trump, around um, a lot of the other um, political debates and arguments around, for example, um, the right-wing parties and populists is around this language. So we're, we're actually on the fringes of all these kinds of language when we look at this. And I think you will see the relevance. And it's also highly re relevant for development studies. So it's, it's far from uh, esoteric and, and theory. It is very practical and it affects us all every day. 
So for example, just last week, this government minister, the minister for care, ironically, in the, uh, said there's a downside to many wearing uh, these things. Some people find mask wearing difficult. It's a personal choice. Many people do not wear masks. It's about personal choice. We are not the sort of country that tells you what to wear. So this is the kind of language which is related to neoliberalism. And we will see why that is connected in a minute. Now this you might think is a temporary and relatively uh, minor aspect of it. But a few years ago, 2008, we had the global financial crisis which started in the United States, the financial crash, and that is directly linked to the problems um, caused by neoliberal thinking. And if anyone hasn't seen the film, uh, The Big Short, which is quite cheap to rent, it's a really interesting film because it highlights a number of the aspects of lack of regulation, which were a consequence of the way in which financial sector in a number of countries, including Britain, United States has been deregulated as a result of neoliberal ideology. So here's the, the film, which is a very good one to watch. And it's quite interesting because the problem was predicted by the people who are portrayed as the heroes of this film. So the, a short outline, why is the terminology so confusing? Um, and I will go to a rather a strange place. I will start talking about modes of production, which is actually a Marxist terminology. And I will explain why this is relevant to understanding what we're going to be looking at. And we will be looking at it in relation to class. So it will be involved class analysis. We also need to understand a bit of what's happened over the last 200 years, which is related to changing modes of production. Modes of production is just jargon for systems of political economy, systems of production. And the transition over the last 200 years from laissez-faire capitalism to welfare capitalism, which is what you might typify in um, uh, most of the richer um, capitalist countries in the period since the Second World War up to about 1980, and then back to neoliberalism as, if you like, a return of laissez-faire and neoclassical economists. So that's the journey we need to look at and understand. We need to understand why did this happen? How did it happen? Um, how did it go from laissez-faire to welfare capitalism? Well, because if we use class analysis, we see that in the 19th century, in the colonial territories, there were anti, um, there were slave rebellions in amongst some of the um, people in Britain and other countries, there were anti-slave movements. There was class and gender struggle over rights, over voting, over work standards. So for example, why was it possible up until about the 19, 1840s in Britain for factories to employ children as young as six in some of the production processes. So what were the work standards there? and When did uh, education come about and, and, and so on? And then again, also in the colonies, we have the emergence of independence movements and resistance. So all of these things count as part of the way in which capitalism in the 19th century in the West was challenged in a number of ways, both within the countries and from the overseas territories in ways which led eventually to the emergence of what became called welfare capitalism or some, in some cases, social democracy. So we need to look at that. And then we need to understand, well, what is neoliberalism and how does it link to development in, and because I specialize on climate change, how does it link to climate change as well? We will look briefly at some of the theoreticians. Um, if you have not heard of it, the Montperlin uh, Society uh, was formed in 1948, which is uh, 47, which is indicative of the emergence of the Cold War and the Soviet Union as an opponent of Western capitalism. And economists like Hayek, Milton Friedman, Becker, the Chicago School and so on, Montpellerin was formed in um, a, um, a small resort in the United States. It's the, just the name of the place where they met in a hotel. Um, we need to understand Western neoliberalism and its adherents, who were its political supporters, and predominantly 
uh, President Reagan in the United States and Margaret Thatcher as Prime Minister of Britain are its political adherents. So they were the supporters of this um, ideology and economic, th uh, economic theory. We then look, um, if there's time, at the difference between economic growth and human development, because this is economic growth has become, although it is, of course, part of normal capitalism, the kind of brand of capitalism that is neoliberalism uh, really worships economic growth in a much more uh, rabid way and uh, in, in a challenge to uh, well-being and human development. And we will uh, look in that context at the so-called Washington Consensus, SAPs, which means structural adjustment programs promoted by the World Bank and the IMF, and PRSPs, which is poverty reduction strategies and programs, decentralization, we'll come back to those. So that's the outline of what we're doing. Now, here is the Mont Pelerin Society, still going. Uh, its meeting here is quite interesting because it's in Guatemala. Um, and it champions its ideas from 1947. So just read that. I'm not going to bore you by reading it out, but just read that because this kind of summarizes a lot of what we're about. Okay, so you can see here that we're in the, in the territory of what does freedom mean? And you can see that in that statement there, which is still on their website, we have the ideas which are there amongst ideas of Brexit, amongst uh, Trump supporters and amongst others who say they don't want to be ruled by government. They don't want government to tell them that they should get vaccinated, for example. And you know about all the anti-vaccine um, resistance in, in a number of countries. And they also promote their um, notable members. These are all their, their um, members, notable members who got Nobel Prizes. You'll see that almost all of them are economists. There's uh, Vargas Loza down there at the bottom for literature, but all the others are economists. And if you like, this highlights the problem with economics as a discipline, which we can come back to uh, later on. And in the United States, but also in Britain, you have a number of these foundations or so-called think tanks. I think that's being generous to call them think tanks because they're basically supporters of a kind of ideology rather than deep critical thinking. So you have the Liberty Fund. So here we have a use of the word liberty in relation to this. And you can see it's um, liberty seeks to preserve the wisdom and learning of the ages and strengthen our understanding and the appreciation of individual liberty and responsibility. So you can see how these all, all this language kind of joins up. And um, here's the Cato Institute, also a very famous United States one. I'm not going to read these out. These are for you to read afterwards to see um, that, well, here at the top, it's about, in, again, individual liberty, limited government, free markets, and peace, which is quite interesting. And here's another one. Uh, well, well, that gives you the summary. And then the Freedom Foundation. So all of these things ha have been quite interesting in recent years because some of them have been linked up with climate change denial. They've been linked up with support for Trump and support for um, other right-wing areas of, of thinking. Now, Trina, who is, um, hasn't written very much, but he wrote this, which I think is a very helpful um, definition of neoliberalism. And what I want you to take from this is where the operation of a market or a market-like structure is seen as an ethic in itself capable of acting as a guide for all human action and substituting for all previously existing ethical beliefs. So the accusation is sometimes made about neoliberal thinking that it's almost like a religion. And it's something which is believed in against the evidence. So this is something I would like you to think about. But I want to give you some concrete examples of where Trina's definition is quite useful. So examples of how to create markets 
And with that comes very often the restricting of people's access to common property resources. So this is a vital part of it, is controlling what previously was understood to be accessible by everyone in a particular locality or um, system of production, and that then it becomes privately owned and privately controlled under the ideology that that is for the benefit of humankind. But the problem is once it's marketized and privatized, it becomes inevitably for the benefit of those who control the market and that particular resource. Now, in relation to development studies, one of the most prominent of these is land rights and the forcible purchase or privatization of land, which is used by people, especially in the global south, for their own livelihoods. So this is very, very relevant to us in development studies. So this is in the area of kind of enforced purchases, land grabbing, and so on. Another key one is the transferring of public services to private ownership. So that they, this is the privatization agenda, but it's even more than that. And the sharing economy, uh, when it started, Airbnb uh, was trying to make the claim that they were enabling ordinary people to make a bit more extra money by um, uh, renting out their spare room. Um, and this was the sharing economy. This was a collective, in other words, they made the claim that this was kind of a collective public service, which in fact was them privatizing access to a very, um, uh, very profitable income stream. And then of course we have the social media where we, if we engage in the social media, become the product and our, our information is then traded for the benefit of, benefit of advertising and as we now know for political manipulation so that adverts can be targeted at us to pursue political goals as, as well. And then in climate change, which is particularly interesting, the problem is that most of the ways in which it is proposed to reduce climate um, um, greenhouse gases is through so-called market solutions. So for example, um, trading systems for carbon credits. So this has been a major barrier to success in dealing with climate change over the last 20 years or more, because the organizations at the top who had power to do this imposed on how we deal with climate change a market mechanism which is bound not to work. And here's another very concrete example. This is the World Bank ideology in practice. So here we have um, a, um, a tweet, which is a critical tweet, where someone, uh, Hickel, you might know him from his, his books on inequality, said, uh, Chris, uh, the World Bank, somebody at the World Bank said, 71% of Bhutan is covered in forest, um, but it contributes only 2% to GDP. Here we are back to worshiping um, GDP and economic growth as the key thing that needs to be done. So what needs to be done? Well, of course, eventually they will want to argue that it should be privatized and they will argue that it then provides wealth for GDP. Um, well, we know how this goes in most countries where these forests have been privatized, et cetera. So here is the ideology, the religion at work um, a few years ago from uh, the World Bank. Oh, there, those are his books on the right there. Um, why is the terminology confusing? Where does it come from? Well, here we go back, have to go back into history, but first I'm going to give you what you might regard as the 10 key characteristics of um, neoliberalism. And I'm not going to talk about them all because it, it will take too much time. This is a reference slide for you. Um, so it means fiscal policy discipline, government um, being proper in how it manages the fiscal aspects of the economy, reducing public spending on subsidies, um, tax reform, but this does not mean fair taxation. It means, um, well, we, we'll come back to that. This is very interesting that it talks about tax reform. Uh, uh, competitive exchange rates, trade liberalization. This means allowing countries having to allow for imports um, and reducing barriers to imports, reducing tariffs and so on. Allowing inward foreign direct uh, investment into the countries, in, especially in the global south. 
privatization of state enterprises, deregulation, which we'll come back to, um, legal security for property rights, which means if you get something privatized, you can control it and nobody can claim it back. And in the global south, uh, much of this was actually implemented through the structural adjustment programs of the 1980s and 90s, in which the World Bank and the IMF said, if, if your government does not accept these, um, uh, these uh, so-called reforms, then you won't have access to World Bank and IMF finance. So these were conditions put on it. If you want to get loans from us, then you have to abide by let privatizing your um, industries, letting foreign direct investment, liberalizing your trade regimes, and um, um, uh, shrinking the state. In other words, reducing welfare spending. Um, so this was the way in which the ideology of neoliberalism was imposed onto uh, the global south. Now, um, I want to highlight some of the actors who follow along with this. Um, I'm not exactly picking on PricewaterhouseCoopers, although there's pl plenty of reason to do that, but I want to just highlight this kind of virtue signaling that these corporations engage in. So um, just have a read, read of this kind of social wash. We all know about green wash. This is social wash. Makes them look like very good people, doesn't it? Well, they were also implicated in tax avoidance and they were actively, along with the other major British accountancy firms, the so-called Big Four, they were account. They were um, found out to be aggressively helping corporations and individuals avoid paying tax. So here we have them saying that they want the world to be good and sustainable, environmental, social governance issues, and here they were caught out by twisting and um, actually going to corporations and saying. We can save you a hell of a lot of corporation tax if you let us run your accounting system. Um, and ironically, at the top of this, this is a British newspaper, The Independent. At the top is the advert. You know, get, you get these adverts at the top. Does anyone recognize that logo? Um, it's HSBC, okay? So HSBC is advertising here. That's just by chance. I got it on my, my feed. Um, and HSBC a few years ago was fined several billion dollars for cheating um, in its organization of uh, several things. One was uh, exchange rates, but the other was laundering money for um, uh, Latin American um, drug cartels. So they're deeply impl implicated in running the dirty economy um, and incidentally, the, the so-called dark economy, um, some people call it the black economy, is, of course, nobody knows exactly, but we know now from tax havens and so on, it is probably around 20% of global um, uh, product, um, uh, which is a global, um, you can't call it domestic product, global product, around 20% of it is hidden in the um, so-called dark economy or black economy, and it's hardly ever discussed in development studies. So we carry on blithely thinking that we can have an influence over an economy where a sizable chunk of the global economy is actually deliberately run by crooks, politicians, and, uh, and others, and corporations uh, for their own private benefit. So key factors in neoliberal capitalism. Now I want to stress here, that neoliberal capitalism is one flavor of capitalism. What we need to understand is why did it become the dominant flavor in much of the world after 1980? It is not the only way in which capitalism can be run. It was preceded by welfare capitalism or social democratic capitalism. So why did it change and how did it change? Well, one of the things that changed was demands by the classes that want to run capitalism to reduce the um, regulation of their businesses to make the, their businesses run more smoothly with less interference 
And we can see the implications of that very clearly. So one was regulations to reduce inspections or safety issues. In fact, one of the architects of neoliberalism, Milton Friedman, was on record as saying that he thought building regulations were an unfair imposition on the profitability of construction companies. So we rely on building codes to make sure we live and uh, work in safe buildings. And he thought they were a nuisance. So this led in recent decades to the idea that there's too much red tape. We need a bonfire of the red tape. And we saw what happened exactly there with the Grenfell Tower disaster in 2017. Now, if you're not from Britain, you don't know about this. It's a very interesting case to look at because it has been directly linked to the reduction in regulation and the privatization of previous services which were run by public bodies, especially the local government. And um, David Alexander there says, no other disaster better exemplifies the importance of class, power and money and political influence in the fight for safety and security. In other words, 72 people died because regulation was reduced and private sector took over activities which previously had been in the public realm. Another one which will probably you will know about was the Boeing 737 MAX, two of which crashed, uh, killing more than 300 people, which has been directly linked by investigations to the reduction of regulation by the FAA, the Federal Aviation Agency in the United States. So um, the, um, the company uh, um, was reducing its, um, um, uh, there was weaker regulation. Um, the regulation relationship with Boeing was too cozy and they were cost saving. So they were doing things that were reducing costs and all of this is classic neoliberal economics. In the end, it's ironic because it cost them a huge amount of money to deal with the fact they were caught out. Um, they, it was proven that they were doing things wrong and it's cost them $19 billion or more to uh, pick up the mess. So other key factors of neoliberal capitalism, and again, I'm not going to have time to go through them all. I'll just highlight a few. This is a, another reference side, slide so you can see. Uh, it's very much about an ideological preference for the private sector. Now, those of you who have been in Britain in the last two years will have seen in Britain that the private sector has been favored in dealing with COVID. So this is giving private contracts to sometimes companies that have never done anything to um, provide goods and services in relation to COVID. Um, in relation to Brexit, it happened as well. Um, uh, and I'm not gonna have time to go into it, but the, um, one of the most ironic ones was a company which claimed it would improve the ferry service between Britain and France. And this was a company which had no ships, but it was given the contract because it had favors from the um, Tory party in government. So a preference for this, Reduced state spending. So before COVID happened, Britain was under extreme austerity measures where welfare spending was being reduced, reduced, reduced. And some of you from overseas might have been shocked at the number of people living on the streets in Brighton and, and London. And you probably have been become aware that a million households in Britain have to go to food banks every week um, to, uh, in order to survive. Many of them are working. It isn't that they are out of work, they are working, but the pay in work does not cover their, even their basics like food. And this is because of a reduction in state spending in the last 15 to 20 years um, in order to uh, supposedly balance the books. And the idea of there being a small state and people being responsible for their own um, welfare. Denationalization, privatization, corporatization, all of these things, um, which um, utilities, education, universities now are not really public institutions anymore. They are corporations. And um, as corporations, they are profit maximizing or income maximizing. Um, you won't be aware that about 50% of all teaching now in British universities is done by people who are on temporary, um, almost zero hours contracts. 
it doesn't apply to IDS, but it does apply to Sussex and most other universities are paying people a pittance to teach in order to minimize their costs. Um, and well, we can say a lot more about that. We can come back to it. You also, you will not be aware that two years ago, the university arbitrarily shortened the term uh, to lose one week of the term. So students, despite paying those high fees, get two weeks less teaching a year in order that they could save costs. Public-private partnerships are quite interesting, also linked to private finance initiatives. This is where the um, government at national or local level allocates a contract to the private sector to either share in provision of a service or hand over the service to a private provider. Um, and this is also linked up with outsourcing, cleaning, catering, and so on. Um, now, it's all about a supposed free market and competition, which we'll come back to. This is the kind of ideology of co competition and market forces can determine people's well-being um, and competition between suppliers and so on. Um, lead tables is another, um, uh, another way which, if we have time, please ask me a question about why is neoliberalism relevant to schools and universities in Britain? Uh, because I would love to spend a bit more time on that. Um, the Washington Consensus, which I've mentioned already, is that now one of the problems is that all of these changes have been incremental. In other words, it's extremely difficult to build up. Nobody ever says, right, in 1980, we're going straight from welfare capitalism to neoliberalism. Uh, people might then have had the ability to say, actually, we don't like the look of that because it's going to destroy the welfare state and the benefits we get um, outside of our, our wage or salary, they didn't have a chance to do that. So this was uh, drip, 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 drip. Um, so each change incrementally was extremely difficult to avoid or oppose. Uh, so as younger people enter the economy, it's the norm. People don't know what it was like before. That is why I think talking about neoliberalism and you knowing about it is so important. Um, and belief in the in it is ideological. Um, and it, it's, it promotes supporters of the ideology who are incompetent or unsuited, but are ideological allies of those who have power. Um, and it ignores evidence. Um, it also lowers taxes for corporations and the risk and the rich, leading to um, um, greater inequality, which we'll, we'll come back to um, and they claim that inequality is necessary for economic growth. So it's part of the process. You promote e economic growth by inequality. Inequality is justified as part of the process of enabling economic growth. So this is public-private partnerships, which is a key part in relation to development as well, as you'll see in a minute. This is a body that supports private partnerships, public-private partnerships. I'll leave that for you to read afterwards. Um, this is a very nice kind of ironic take on it. And we see that it is becoming embedded because of power, systems of power, becoming embedded into development through the sustainable development goals, because there is this claim that the private sector will help to achieve the SDGs. But it also enables the empowerment of the wealthy. So here is Price Waterhouse Coopers, I mentioned before, um, enriching an individual. This is in 2019, after the British government had complained to Price Waterhouse Coopers about it not doing the right thing in terms of saving people tax. So this man, man used Price Waterhouse Coopers to save thirty um, to save four billion pounds in tax by moving abroad. Um, we see it here in France, uh, where this bank was actually caught out by the French government and was fined. That's a huge fine, $3.7 billion uh, euros fine um, uh, for, again, enabling organizations to cheat on, on tax. And that is, that's the summary of, of it there. Um, one of the other ways in which this works 
is that you have what's called the revolving door between government and corporations. So there will be people moving from government into private corporations and private corporations, uh, senior people becoming involved in the government, either as politicians or as civil servants. And um, this has become a, a, a scandal in, in Britain. So critiques of civil servants and politicians engaging in this. And you might be surprised to know that the, um, the accountancy corporations actually supply people to the civil service to write the tax laws. So companies like Deloitte and um, Pricewaterhouse will say to the treasury, we're very happy to give you some economists to help you write the tax laws. Well, we know how that goes. Here are the big, big four. The strange um, symbol logo on the bottom right one is meant to be an E and a Y for Ernst Young. Um, here's an example of the um, revolving door where somebody got caught out. He was working uh, with Deloitte. Now, some of the rich don't like this and they protest about it. I think this is quite interesting. This is just last week. Some of the millionaires in Britain have petitioned the um, Treasury Minister to increase taxes on them because they believe that this is wrong. And the same happened a few years in, ago in the United States. You've all probably heard of Warren Buffet. Um, and uh, he is, um, um, along with a number of other billionaires, protesting that they should be taxed more. So they can see the unfairness in this, which I think is a, quite an interesting Thing, but they don't all. So you have to ask, well, why do those who have more money than could, they could ever, ever spend in a lifetime, why are they not protesting that they should pay more tax? There should be more fame. For, um, here's another revolving door. Somebody who was in the um, Environment Agency, which is a government a agency to look and so-called protect the environment, who then joined Southern Water. Now, Southern Water um, last year was fined several million pounds for releasing sewage into rivers and into the sea, and they were fined for this. And so this is kind of a, uh, a sweetheart deal where they try to, uh, the corporations deliberately recruit people from government agencies because it means that they will have a more cozy relationship um, in these privatized corporations. So these public utilities, which when I did economics at school, we were taught that things like water and it, uh, power were natural monopolies. They should not be privatized because it was natural that they would be a public good and a public service to be provided by a public utility. Lord, thank uh, you. That's um, gone. Um, here's the um, um, fine for the, um, that company uh, because of discharging its sewage. Of course, when it does that, it doesn't have to purify the sewage, so it makes a lot more money. It saves on its costs. So uh, these accountancy firms um, love neoliberalism because it helps them to uh, make more money because they recruit more people and corporations to make money. So um, I'm going to skim over this. You can read this um, to get more, more uh, detail later on. And these are criticisms of their behavior by uh, a government, uh, not a government, a parliamentary committee uh, a few years ago. OK, so uh, also just a reminder that the European Union and the USA are not free market in practice. The governments support huge bailouts or subsidies, especially to agriculture and to um, fossil fuel industries, um, which uh, are very, very large indeed, um, and have been doing that for years and years and years. Okay. So the terminology, where does it come from? Well, neo is just the Greek word for new, and liberalism, well, what does it mean? It's a problem. How do we understand what neoliberalism means when liberalism is not very clear? Well, liberalism is now used by many to mean different things, even contradictory things. And I think the key thing you hear is to understand that it is class-based. It is around the needs of different classes who want to use the terminology for their own purposes. And we need to go back into history to understand why that is the case. 
So basically, neoliberalism is the new version of 19th century liberalism, which was often called laissez-faire, which is French, French for let it happen. Free trade, reduced little government interference. In other words, what is called classical economics. Classical economics um, or liberal economics. So it's an approach that argues that allowing market forces to determine what happens in the economy is the best way to allocate resources efficiently and even fairly for the maximum benefit of humankind. So its ideology is to make the claim that everyone benefits when the economy is operating on this basis. And the role of the state should be very, very limited. In fact, proponents of neoliberalism in the United States argue that the only role for the government should be in defense and foreign policy. Um, they argue that everything else should be related to the market. So classical e economics is based on a principle called homo economicus, economic man or mankind, if you want to be gender neutral, but it was called economic man. And this is therefore sometimes called neoclassical economics. It's the economics that goes with this. So they claim to have a theory which justifies the underlying to this. And the belief is that markets are able to solve all problems if they can operate without constraint, meaning regulation. So it's an ideological belief in the, both the efficiency of markets and the fairness of markets. So in the USA now, since neoliberalism has ar arrived, the word liberal is left-wing and is normally thought of as restricting markets with a significant role for the state, especially around welfare and regulation, doing things like making sure that building codes are implemented, that planes don't crash, um, that water supply is done uh, in, with good water, etc. And liberalism, therefore, became uh, left-wing, while neoliberalism is right-wing. So it's extremely confusing. So the word liberal, actually from the Latin, meaning free or generous, someone is liberal with their money, or unconstrained, you can see how the word can be used by those who support free markets and capitalism to want to use it in that way. We want to be free con from constraints that might otherwise affect how we can run businesses. So it became, from the 16th and 17th centuries, it meant free from restraint. But look there, in speech or action. In other words, as Europe emerged from aristocratic feudal monarchies, the idea of liberalism was the ability to challenge feudal, feudal um, despotism as well as to promote businesses. And this is where the class implication of it comes up, because as Europe fades out from feudalism into capitalism, as capitalism emerges, there are different class interests in what capitalism will look like. So workers prefer a kind of capitalism which gives them freedom of speech, freedom to form trade unions, freedom to protest about high prices of wheat, freedom to uh, argue for the vote in order to have greater control over society. And all of those freedoms were opposed by the capitalists who wanted freedom from the state telling them how to run their business and reduction in the problem of running their businesses with impositions from the state. So basically here we see that as Europe and other countries emerge from feudalism, we have the reason why the word splits into two different things, depending what your class interest is. Do you want freedom of association, freedom of speech, freedom of protest in order to improve your conditions? Or do you want freedom to run business completely or largely without the role of the state telling you what you can and cannot do? So this is key reason why the terminology is so confusing. And if you go back to my early slides about those freedom institutes and Cato and so on, you can see how this division in the understanding of the word lives on today. Now, of course, this was also linked to the Enlightenment. 
um, which is about the logic of science explaining what things go on in the world. So there is an overlap here with the science and the emergence of social sciences, which claim to uh, explain how the world operates. And economics becomes the social science, claiming to be a science. And actually, originally, it was called political economy, which is alongside the natural sciences, helping to explain what goes on. So the idea of, near, of classical economics is that it is um, a, um, a science. Um, from here, we can see how it is possible for this word liberal to become both right wing and left wing. So it's very, very confusing. The etymology website there on the bottom there is quite interesting on this. So we have this confusing terminology where you can have left wing and right wing who also want to use the word liberal. Um, and the right wing allies it much more with liberty, uh, liberty, freedom from constraint. Both use freedom, freedom from what to do what. On the left side, and this is an important distinction for us in development studies, is the idea that if people are poor, it is a system causation. It is not because they're not trying hard enough. And if it's on the right, then you think that if people are poor, it's because they're not working hard enough. They're not taking responsibility for themselves. Now, you probably know that in the United States, this is part of the ideology, is that everyone can succeed. Even a black man can become president of the United States. If you're poor, it's your fault. You haven't worked hard enough. You've squandered your resources. You haven't done the right thing in your life. You hadn't got educated enough. And education is something you choose rather than is determined for you, and so on. So on the left side, government needs to moderate market failures. On the right, you need small government not interfering in how it works. And so we have this, how in reality it's panned out to this um, this division. Um, now, I think what I'm going to do there is actually stop. <laughs> I've, I've run out of time in order to give you some uh, chance for questions and comments. Um, I will share all the slides, but you can see the rest of it on videos from last year because um, uh, these have been recorded, so you will be able to see it, um, the rest of this from last year. But just to finish off with a clarification, um, is neoliberalism the same as globalization? No, it is not. Uh, neoliberalism is a flavor of capitalism, whereas globalization is the outcome of how different kinds of capitalism have operated in the last 50 years or so. So that, no, they're not the same. As is neoliberalism the same of capitalism? The answer is the same, that neoliberalism is one flavor of many different kinds of capitalism. And so we need to actually understand that this is quite different. So we've got to that point where I will now hand over because I realize some of you may also need to go to classes at two o'clock. So forgive me for not finishing, but you do have the chance to see the rest of this talk in um, recordings that were made last year. But I do now want to give you a chance because I'm sure there will be questions and comments. So I'm going to stop sharing so I can see you. But if you do need to refer to a particular slide, then please um, do shout out and I can put the slide back up. And I will also, um, James, is it appropriate if I share the slides now in the chat box? Is that all right? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I will go on to and find the recordings uh, from last year. We're all up on our YouTube page. Uh, there's three or four. Excellent. I'll share those around. Uh, okay. Just to say thank you to you know Terry. That was absolutely brilliant. And for the Q and A, please feel free to raise your hand. And if you want to unmute yourself and ask uh, your question, it's absolutely fine. Or if you want to type into the chat, I can uh, I can read out for you. Yeah, so, I I'm going to have problems putting the slides in the chat. So James, if you could do that, the PDF there. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Save me doing that. Is that all right? So I can now see you all. Lovely to see you all. And um, um, please do um, stick your hand up or open your microphone if you want to ask something. So there's a question from Omar, and then I had one as well that I'd like to, uh, to ask to get the ball rolling. OK, where do you want to go first, to Omar? Please, Omar, yeah, you, you go ahead. Yeah, thank yes, you. Hi, uh, thank you, Terry. Um, my question is regarded, uh, are, are you, do you hear me very well? We yeah. can hear you. Yeah, okay. 
So uh, my question is regarded um, neoliberalism and um, I would say uh, highly corrupted governments and inefficient bureaucracies. So in these um, situations, like for instance, I came from Sudan and uh, we have a very high inflation, uh, 300, 400 per year. And this is due to the government printing um, currency to subsidize fuel, to subsidize bread, and to subsidize other um, branches of the government that, that are not efficient, like the, the bureaucracy is not efficient. However, they do that uh, to maintain their political um, status quo. Um, so my question is regarding in this situation when you have a very high corrupted government, any governments, and they use this money to patronage, to, to, to increase their political voice, etc. cetera. Uh, do new, new liberalism become the solutions of removing the state from the, um, yeah, like, like in reducing the, the power of this highly corrupted state uh, and giving views to the market? Or do you think that this is also not a solution? Now, I don't know, what do you think? I just uh, also just to point out that now, after uh, we started the SMP program with the World Bank, uh, the government started to, to um, remove the subsidies on fuel, on bread, and finally, after three years now, inflation rates are decreasing. So yeah, what do you think? Okay, it's a very good and very complex question. So I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to do it justice, Omar. Um, but you're, you're quite right to point out that the World Bank and the IMF did target subsidies in um, their uh, dealings with, um, uh, with countries. And they argued that they should be uh, reduced and um, uh, if possible, removed. And these included subsidies on food and on um, fuel, especially. Um, the, uh, incidentally, if you go to the World Bank headquarters in Washington, there they have um, restaurants in the um, in the basement floor, which are still highly subsidized. So uh, I visited there a couple of years ago, and I said, "Are, are these restaurants still subsidized?" And they said, "Oh yes, of course." So they don't apply their own ideology to their own uh, workforce. They all enjoy the benefits of cheap meals in, because they actually accept subsidies in their own restaurants. So hypocrisy there. But the, um, the issue of subsidies, um, it, I, I think it's a really interesting question as to whether or not reducing or removing those subsidies would remove despots. I don't think they do, because I think despots can find other ways of remaining in power, even when there aren't subsidies. So it's not a formula for um, changing the political structure. So there's a number of countries where they did reduce subsidies, where you did not get rid of the despots uh, as a re result of it. It's true that undemocratic governments can use subsidies to try to stay in power. Um, but I don't think it's a recipe to get rid of them by removing the subsidies. So it's not a direct kind of relationship. And that's because the sources of power come from much more, uh, including just using violence, uh, come from much more than uh, repression and violence in, in other ways, much more than buying popularity. Basically these subsidies buy the popularity usually of the urban population. Um, and, and we know that in the, 80s and 90s, there were, they were actually called the IMF riots. So in countries which tried to remove subsidies, I think Egypt was one, Morocco, Tunisia were others, there were uh, large scale uh, outbreaks of popular unrest as these subsidies were reduced and removed. And they were called IMF riots because it was the IMF insisting that these subsidies be reduced um, in order that those countries could get loans from uh, the IMF and the World Bank. So I don't, I don't see much sign that reduced subsidies actually is a guarantee that you produce um, uh, a more uh, a governments which are less despotic and less repressive. Thank you. Oh, thank you for that. So yes, um, I'm just putting the recordings from last year into the chat box for you all to see if you'd like to look, look at them later on. We have another question from uh, Julia. You've got your hand up. If you'd like to uh, unmute yourself. Hi, thank you. Um, thank you for a really interesting um, presentation, Terry. Um, 
my question was around markets in um, the action on climate and wondering whether you see any role for market-based action on climate and also sort of questioning the definition of market-based action on climate as being neoliberal as opposed to being a form of capitalism. So I guess I'm thinking like if you're using carbon prices or taxes or valuing nature as a form of pricing in the externality along with other state-based actions, is that not more a form of social capitalism or some other name as opposed to being strictly neoliberal? So I guess I'm one question on the definition and another question on kind of your view on market-based mechanisms in, in tackling yeah. climate. Well, I think that there's a difference between how you price carbon and how you price natural resources and whether or not they should be properly um, costed. Uh, and I think there's a very strong argument that there should be proper costing of natural resources um, so that the um, cost of the damage done by extracting those resources and using them is actually embedded in the price. Um, now, um, how you find what that price might be is extremely difficult, and those who oppose pricing those resources would argue that sometimes the um, problem is that they cannot be given a dollar price because they have non-market valuations. So um, the, the value of a hectare of Amazon rainforest to an Amazonian tribe is infinite. You can't put a price on it. And as soon as you demand that they accept a price for it, you've completely compromised their way of life and the way that they might want to choose to live. So it's the imposition by outsiders of a system of power through pricing, which may be opposed, very rightly opposed by the people affected. But as regards um, carbon, I think the issue there is that uh, the, um, uh, to, to my mind, the preferable way of dealing it, with it would be pricing carbon at the source of where it was extracted. So you actually price the, um, the resource by saying every, every time you take a ton of oil or a barrel, a, a ton of coal or a barrel of oil out the ground, you have to, you put a tax on that, which is the, the deterrent for using that because you then say, well, this is going to cause this amount of damage both now in terms of immediate air pollution, and we know that tens of thousands of people are killed by immediate air pollution from burning coal, and future pollution, which is changing the climate through global warming. So if that was done, you would uh, have needed to tax only a few thousand entities uh, around the world, uh, a few thousand oil and coal companies. Now, of course, no individual government would have accepted that because it meant an, an international imposition of a tax rate on um, national corporations, which they didn't want. Um, but as we can see, the mess from that is we have, have nothing that is meaningful in terms of restricting the amount of, of um, carbon dioxide that, that is being emitted. So um, what would have been extremely difficult politically to impose instead of having a discussion over 10 years about how we might need to implement it, we've had more than 20 years of fake market solutions, which have made the problem worse. So that would be uh, my slightly differentiated argument between some types of resources and carbon um, in relation to um, uh, climate change. So we've got another question in from uh, Ben at KVD. So he says, uh, really interesting, in really interesting presentation, uh, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on the CSR law in India and the privatization development funding. Is this one of the possible futures for funding in the sector? Um, okay. Um, by CSR, you mean corporate social responsibility. Ben, ben where are you? I can't see you. Hi, Terry. Uh, yes, yes, that's right. Okay. I don't know the law on CSR in India. Um, I do have a very good example from a few years ago when the largest, uh, one of the largest energy companies um, uh, put its CSR policy on its website and it was just unbelievably pathetic. But that, when was the law enacted? Because I don't follow India and I don't know the CSR law. 
I'm not sure of the specifics. It's been around for a few years now. Um, essentially, if a, if a company makes a net worth of more than five crows, which I think maybe is 50 million rupees a year, they have to give 2% of their profit to CSR activities. Okay. All right. Well, that immediately you've just defined it as pathetic. <laughs> so the law is pathetic if it's that amount of money. Um, so it doesn't say very much for it. Um, also, the CSR activities do not compensate for the damage done. So the same company that was giving that 2% uh, a few years ago was investing $19 billion in a coal mine in Australia to mine coal to bring to India to be, to be used in coal uh, power generation. Um, so CSR would only be meaningful if it actually compensated entirely for the damage done by the corporation in its activities. Um, so uh, that would be my response on that. The second question is about privatizing of development funding. Uh, um, um, there are two issues here. One is, uh, is whether or not development funding, in other words, foreign aid is good. Um, but the second part of it is privatizing it is, it, even if it is good, it's making it bad, it's making it not good. Um, so I think that um, this is, um, that I would say there's two aspects to that. One is that we have to question whether foreign aid is a good thing. I think we have to have that conversation, including IDS. That's a very difficult conversation, but really, really important. Um, we are supposed to be decolonizing development studies and decolonizing IDS. And there's a quite a strong argument that foreign aid is actually a form of neo-colonization. And I think that that is something we should be discussing. But if we were to say, is it good to privatize development aid? I would say no, because that removes, the, the to the extent that you do have some form of uh, supposed democratic control over the aid process, that removes that. And I think that would be a negative thing. So I would give that two part answer to it um, if, if that um, helps. And no doubt we will need to come, come back to that. Um, Thanks, Terry. Okay, Ben. So we've got another question uh, from Shannon. She asks, um, thank you for the interesting presentation, Terry. Uh, I have a general and a more theater theoretical question. Do you think it is possible that another ideology should, could challenge the hegemony of neoliberalism? Um, well, I don't think it's whether it can, I think it must. So I, I think the origins of the alternative ideology are emerging in, um, in support in Britain and United States amongst young people for what some people call socialism. I think it's around um, uh, campaigns like uh, Black Lives Matters uh, around um, uh, Extinction Rebellion and other protests against the way in which um, uh, neoliberalism operates. So I, I, I think the answer is that we have to um, develop these and we have to um, multiply them and, and basically acknowledge that the only way in which we're going to change this is through mass grassroots protest movements. Um, and I think that is, um, that is what has to happen. Um, my, my worry is that IDS ends up providing people to continue the system rather than to challenge the system. We all need jobs. And in those jobs, we have to be thinking about is what we're doing actually helping the system perpetuate or is it carrying on? So for example, this goes back to uh, Ben's point about privatizing aid. I think that most aid that goes through international NGOs in, is in effect a form of privatization because these large international NGOs are basically corporations um, in which there is very little control over whether or not they do good things. There's no, um, a project carried out by an NGO in most cases, nobody ever goes back after five years or even 10 years to see if there's any legacy of whether or not that project did a good thing. And I would love to start an organization, a volunteer organization, which I call 10 Plus, the Development Checker, where volunteers like yourselves find in your country a project that existed, um, was done 10 years ago, 
and go and visit the place and see whether you can see, is there anything there that shows any sign that this ever took place? And my hypothesis is, and a number of people have said they accept it, is that in most places you wouldn't find any, any trace of it. So basically, and I've talked to senior people in two large international NGOs who say our organizations have just become contract machines. We are there to um, process applications for funding. Uh, we then do the project, we process it. The money pays extremely high salaries to the people at the top of the NGO. Um, I don't know if you're aware, but Save the Children Fund, the top five staff, this is a few years ago, um, so it may have gone up, we're each receiving more than 160,000 pounds a year. Um, so I think that, that we need to think about, well, what does an NGO, a large INGO, what does it mean now? Because I think it's a version of corporatization under neoliberalism um, of the, the aid system. So um, going back to your question, Sharon, um, I think it's about um, starting up mass movements. Um, part of that would be decolonizing IDS and decolonizing development studies to actually say, well, what would a development studies look like if it actually took account of the, the power relationships in which we are embedded in how we as development people interact with the global South? So that would be the short answer that we desperately need this alternative ideology. Thank you. Uh, Julia, you had uh, one more question. Thank you. Yes, sorry for, for hogging the mic. Um, I had a question. It was, um, I don't know if you're um, familiar with the work of Mariana Mazzucato, but she was on a recent um, reading list that we had a couple of weeks ago. And I found her writing quite interesting. Um, and in some ways, you know, it's thinking about uh, increasing increased state role in terms of being a market shaper and investing more um, and also kind of addresses some of the challenges from the cartoon you showed in terms of uh, suggesting setting up a fund whereby governments are able to capture some of the returns from the investments that they're making and the risks that they're taking. But I just wondered um, if you have a view on her and whether there are kind of caveats that I've missed if you see her approach, you know, in many ways she's kind of accepting market ideology, for example. Um, so I just wondered if you had reflections on her work. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I haven't yet caught up with her work. Um, I, I just started the process of looking at it actually by coincidence just this week. So I intend to look at one of her videos, uh, which is waiting for me on my on my screen. So I can't comment on her work. So I'm sorry about that. No problem. I'll hope to uh, catch you at another date once you've well, watched once the videos. I'd love to be, <laughs> you to have a conversation about it, Julia, which I would love to do. That would be great. Thank yeah. you. So we've got a, another question in from uh, Kritika uh, asking, are there independent organizations that work particularly as whistleblowers on these nexuses of power? Um, we, yes, there are. And you, you would have seen two, two weeks ago, the Pandora um, case, which has been uh, these papers released from government and uh, corporate interests, which are exactly that. They, they, publicized private um, documents, which are about corruption, the operation of the tax havens uh, and so on. And these documents quite clearly show the links between politics and private corporate interests and the way in which Britain, for example, ad administers seven tax havens overseas, which it has direct control over, but has shown very little sign of actually controlling the way in which they're used for um, private gain and for criminal activities and um, um, the siphoning away of tax avoidance mechanisms. So there, there is the, um, the Institute of Investigative Journalism, which is one of the parties to that, along with The Guardian. And I think it's, it's either the New York Times or the Washington Post. So these have been the whistleblowers on this. Um, and there are... Um, um, well, you know the, the Facebook whistleblower whose case is going on at this, this very moment. So there are organizations that are trying to, to do these things and individuals, very brave individuals, um, uh, doing the, uh, and, uh, a tremendous cost, to, likely tremendous cost to them in their lives. At the micro scale, this has happened in Britain over the National Health Service, for example, in terms of bad behavior 
of corporations in manipulating uh, profitability within the National Health Service, um, which is called where there are attempts to what is called privatized by stealth in, in Britain, where the government is trying to enable more interest by the private sector in the National Health Service. So um, um, there are ways in, 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 in doing that, and um, we, we can share those links, but they're very, very easy to find, these whistleblowers, on, especially on international tax um, and, uh, and so on. If you look at the resources at the bottom of the uh, slides, the last slide is some resources. Um, these are not whistleblowers, but there are some good videos there of people making these these kind of counter arguments. It's very interesting. So I've got a question uh, I'd like to put you, Terry. So one of the things that really started your presentation was the example you gave around uh, Grenfell Tower. I mean, this absolute tragedy that happened, and I'm sure everyone listening is aware of what uh, was taking place. I didn't realize that the investigation inquiry that's been going on has been led by a judge in the UK uh, the families of some of the victims asked that uh, class and also ethnicity be included in the inquiry, that these be relevant to the case. And the judge said, no, he said, no, this isn't relevant. We're not going to discuss it. It's not going to become part of it. So I was wondering what your thoughts are on ideas like ethnicity or gender and what roles these play within neoliberalism. I mean, like, do they matter or are they just absorbed? I mean, can neoliberalism just absorb whatever other ideologies uh, happen to be around it. Is it that dominant? Hmm. But I think in each particular um, application of a decision like that judge's decision, uh, at that sort of more um, micro level, it will be influenced by um, that judge's training, but also possibly political pressure on the judge um, to take it in a particular way. Um, but the in wider terms, the, this kind of idea of um, freedom and liberty is quite interesting in, in, in this because you do have um, organizations which promote economic liberalization, in other words, neoliberal economically, which are also in favor of liberty in relation to gender and sexuality, and who say that the um, uh, true freedom would not restrict people's sexuality, it would be fair on a gender basis and so on. Now, the corporations involved have not done very much to make it fair on a, on a gender basis, but they would be in what, in what some people called socially liberal. In other words, they would not want the state to pass laws which restrict whether or not you can be um, trans or um, exercise um, the same rights as a, a homosexual as you would if you were non-homosexual. So they say they, they, they do not favor state restriction of individual liberties like those. So to that extent, they're at least being, um, if you like, non-hypocritical. But we also know that there are uh, despots, dictators, or would-be dictators who are populists in the sense that they want to use a restriction of liberty on women and on people who um, have different sexualities and who benefit from the um, non-free um, views of the, of the people that they want to get support from either in elections or in non-elected capacities. So they would be, um, wanting to impose uh, that. But I, I don't think, that, therefore, that we can understand this very simply in relation to neoliberalism. I think this cross is cross-cutting. But in the, in the particular thing about the, the, um, uh, the judge of the Grenfell thing, I, it, my own view is that he will see that he's been stupid and he's shot himself on, in the foot on this, since quite clearly class and um, ethnicity are key factors in it. And if, if he doesn't manage to overcome those limitations in the actual report, he will immediately get shouted down because it will be very stupid not to include that. So I, I think he's made a stupid mistake. Oh, thank you, that was really interesting. 
Um, are there any more questions from the audience? Please chuck your hand up or put it into the chat. Or anything further you'd like to, to add? So uh, it's a very broad discussion, but there's so much we've touched on. Yeah, are, are there any more written ones in the chat we need to look at? I think there was one from Jugha Lee. Ah. So Jung Ali asked a uh, very impressive presentation, Terry. Thanks. Uh, my question is that, do you want to read it out so you can, you can fully see it? Yeah, it's in the chat. Um, Jung Ha Lee, would you speak to your question if you're still there? Uh, yes, hi, thank you, uh, Terry. Uh, my, test, my question is that uh, when you see in the view of the neoliberalism, I think there must be some uh, contribution to abortion. Uh, kind of technology development or knowledge dissemination to more uh, population, and then more population can have a more opportunity to uh, to um, to do to try to new uh, something. So, do you think this contribution of neoliberalism are able to offset or compensate compensate depreciation of a depreciation of uh, vulnerable or the powerless, it is my question. Do you have an example of the kind of technology or knowledge that you're you're talking about? Yeah, that is just an example. Sorry? That is just an example. Yeah, but what kind of technology or knowledge do uh, you mean? I think the, uh, the, um, uh, the, the the Facebook or SNS, like this technology, or more um, the robotic technology, like this. The uh, I think the neoliberalism can uh, contribute the like big enterprises to uh, to grow. Well, I, I don't think robots have really solved the problem <laughs> of hunger in India, um, and I don't think they ever will. Um, if you talked about the Green Revolution as a technology um, which might have affected hunger in India, that might be uh, a possible argument that that as a technology of high yielding seeds and, and inputs to um, uh, wheat and rice production, there, there might possibly be an argument that that is um, uh, uh, helpful to hunger and certainly people do make that argument, um, but I don't see how robotics is going to be a solution to hunger or ill health um, in, in much of the world. And th th there is the possibility that robotic operations in medicine might enable a surgeon in, let's say, um, Berlin to operate on somebody in Khartoum um, without having to go to Khartoum to operate on that person. But we can all see that that is not going to apply to the vast majority of people it's going to be minority who are going to get access to, to that. So I think you might want to think about what kind of technology you mean. Uh, if we looked at mobile phone technology, which I don't, I, the other thing is I don't think any of these technologies are a product of neoliberalism. They're just the normal product of the way capitalism operates. Or in China, um, in, in relation to Green Revolution C technology in relation to how the government operates. They're not a product of neoliberalism. They are normal, the normal operation of a capitalist economy. Um, you might suggest that, for example, for Kenya, mobile phone technology um, arose to its significant position um, and in other African countries because the state um, um, enabled it to happen by not playing a significant role. Um, it didn't, the state did not try to say, right, we're going to manage telecoms in this, this, this country and make sure that telecoms is something which is controlled and un, uh, uh, by, by the government. Instead, you had a, a sort of a market economy for uh, mobile phone providers. And as we know, there is widespread popular support for this because, for example, it gives people access to banking and other services um, in their pocket. And, and uh, you, you might argue possibly that mobile phone technology 
is um, its rapid expansion because it would have happened anyway, but it's more rapid expansion is because of the reduction of the way in which the state regulates um, businesses. Um, uh, so that, that might be a potentially in inter interesting discussion. But I, I think in, by and large, most of the impacts of neoliberalism that have been understood in relation to the global south or the global north, most of them are criticized as having a negative effect on people's lives. All right, uh, thank you. And then, uh, Perry, uh, I think uh, I I wanna uh, uh, change uh, change my question a little bit, like this. Uh, the how about the uh, economic development uh, development uh, can uh, from the neoliberalism? Uh, do you think this this economic develop, economic growth? economic growth uh, right. can compensate uh, this, this uh, de deprivation of the vulnerable? Um, that's a huge question. If I understood it correctly, it will require quite a lot of time. And I cover that in the recordings. So you will get some insight into that on the recordings. Basically, conventional capitalism, um, when it's expressed through what I called welfare capitalism, is the balance between how much of GDP is allocated to people's well-being through, for example, free health care, free education, and other services which are organized through the government, through the state. Um, and um, economic growth is, is possible under welfare capitalism. In fact, it was, it, it, it was pretty good. In welfare capitalist countries, economic growth was pretty rapid. It was pretty good. So the two things are not contradictory. What neoliberalism does is to say that um, these welfare facilities should not be provided by the state, or that if they are, they should be reduced. And this is an ideological position. It's not around the idea that, uh, um, uh, and that's what I've tried to talk about, but you'll get more around this in, in the recordings of the lectures because of the, the slides I didn't get to, which is the debate about the difference between human development and economic growth. All right, thank you very much. And just to say that all of those seminars uh, are available on YouTube. Uh, I've put the links into the chat, uh, along with a whole host of other different uh, ideas lectures from uh, previous years. Uh, we've got about five minutes left. Are there any other quick questions? Anyone wants to get in just before we end? No? Well, if not, thank you very much, Terry. This has all right, been- uh, um, James, before we do, I see there's people sitting in a room uh, it's probably more difficult for them. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> uh, it's great you've been there. Do any of you in the room have a question? Because it's probably more difficult for you to come in. If you go to the podium and unmute yourself, you can ask and we should be able to hear you. So the podium at the front. Yeah. There'll be like a little box with a microphone symbol. If you click that, we should be able to hear you. This isn't going to work. Hi. Hello. <laughs> we can hear you. Um, it was a really interesting lecture. Thank you. Um, I think I think it would be interesting. You said you wanted to, if there was time to talk about neoliberalism and its impacts on, on schools and universities. <laughs> had some time to talk about that a little bit. All right. Okay. But I gave you two bits. Basically, universities now have to compete with each other. They're corporations, basically. They're not academic institutions uh, really anymore. Um, if, a, if a subject is not um, getting enough students, they just cut the subject out. And Sussex is doing this for a number of subjects at, at, at the, this very moment. Um, they will cut costs. So for example, they will employ teaching assistants and PhD students to do a lot of the seminar teaching. Um, they've outsourced things like um, cleaning and catering. So these are now private corporations, which um, give the staff very poor conditions of service. Um, they are, uh, they all compete with one another. So uh, Sussex has to compete with all the other universities to try and get the students. So the key thing is how many students do they get each year? Um, so it's what we call bums on seats. And they will do that in various ways. 
Um, generally not by reducing the costs, they will do it in, in, in other ways. So for example, providing accommodation, making sure you can get accommodation when you come um, and, and so on. But another way, and this is where it becomes very, very awkward, another way that universities compete with another uh, at undergraduate level is how many firsts and two ones they give. So you will see that in the last 20 years, undergraduate level, um, the number of, um, now the number of students who get a first or a two one, if you're from abroad, you might not understand what this terminology means, but I'll try and explain it in a minute. Um, the number who get a first or a two one is over 80%. Now in, in the past, those divisions of the quality of your graduation were around 20%. In, in fact, in many years, you, you, in any given class, you might have only one or two students who would get a first class degree. Now, what, why has this happened? This is called grade inflation. And it's happened because students, when they choose their university, will obviously choose one that gives um, more first and two one degrees. They won't go to a university that fails or gives people thirds. And so this has con contributed to massive grade inflation in, in, the, in recent years to, um, to the extent I went to a geography department at the university um, a couple of years ago and on its notice board, it boasted that 98% of its undergraduates got a first or a two one degree. Now my equivalent university geography department uh, was one, as I said, in, in my class, when I graduated, there was one first class degree and maybe four or five two ones. So this is another aspect of the competition, the league tables. The whole university structure is now around league tables, who offers the best, um, what students are going to choose to go to, and, and so on. So some of that's not very comfortable, but, but that's the reality of what's going on. Thank you very much, Terry. Um, we've covered a huge amount. There's an absolute tr uh, trove of different subjects we have touched upon here. And I feel like we might have to do another one of these seminars, perhaps next term, because the, the plethora of different questions that we've had, I think, uh, warrants that. But please do, uh, everyone who's on this call, look at the old recordings up on YouTube. They're from last year. They go into some of these subjects in much more detail. Um, and I really want to thank Terry for doing this. this. Like I said, we do this every year. It's the neoliberalism one. I hope we can do it again. And thank you all for attending. Um, yeah, if you have any questions, Terry's email is there in the chat, and I think we're going to have to do a part two, Terry, perhaps next term, but let's, let's discuss that later. Um, no worries, this, uh, this recording will be up online uh, in the near future as well, if you want to come back and look at it, and also the slides are there, I put them into the chat, you can have a look at the, uh, the PDF. Um, okay, thank you very much for attending, and uh, yeah, best of luck navigating neoliberalism. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank bye. you.